have you have one last session in you? And then wrap up. And then we're gonna wrap up. I'm gonna talk at you again before you leave. We're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna talk about good housekeeping for your MS4 permit. So we talked a lot about this during the DEP overview, or it just seemed like that was a lot of the focus of the discussion of inspections. Um, as I mentioned then, CSN put together a technical bulletin, the stormwater pollution benchmarking tool. And I'm just, we're just gonna take you step by step through the tool and how you can use it in your municipal site, public works yard. Um, one thing I asked Donna to print was the score sheet so you can kind of follow along the different benchmarks that we're looking at. Um, and now I've actually used this tool at a couple of different sites and I would say that the way it's set up is to get to 100. But not all sites, it's not, not every benchmark is applicable at every site. So you would just adjust it accordingly. You might say, okay, we don't have a stream on site, so we're not going to really look at that one. See, but again, this is a good template for getting started. I think it's also, this tool is a really good way to train staff, which I think is required under your permit on some sort of regular basis. And so if you have this tool on site and take your staff through it annually or whatever, it's something that you can document, timestamp, and put in a file somewhere for the dreaded inspection. So many industrial and municipal sites require permits, industrial stormwater permits. In the Chesapeake Bay watershed, we estimate that there are about there are, there are more than twenty thousand of these sites. Um, was it the National Research Council did a review, and they were very highly critical of the existing. They, the, the points that they pulled out that there's inadequate inspection and enforcement, um, paperwork compliance versus actual real world compliance is happening. There's a lot of non filing, and then there's weak or non existent existent monitoring requirements associated with it. Um, many commercial, transport, and institutional sites are hot spots, but they're not being regulated. So, what are hot spots? These are hot spots. These are really dirty sites in the watershed that can be a significant source of pollutants. So this is a landscaping company that's fertilizing their vegetation and it's, as we can all see, draining right into the storm drain. Not very good. Um, that is a, that's a junkyard, right Tom? Yep. Um, that's a pretty nice That's my backyard. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Um, and it's dirt and there's stuff all over the place. These are obviously, I mean, this is a no-brainer, right? These are significant sources of pollution. So different um, commercial, industrial, institutional, municipal, transportation-related operations that have higher levels of stormwater pollutants and or present a higher potential for spills, leaks, or illicit discharges. So here are some common hotspot operations that we've seen, vehicle operations, outdoor material storage places, waste management like the junkyard I just showed you, physical plants, turf and landscaping areas like I just showed you, and then some unique operations that don't fit into any of those categories. So again, tons of existing resources that I really hope DEP knows are out there, but the Center for Watershed Protection, which I don't know if you all know this, but that's, Tom started that many years ago. Um, so we work very closely with them. Put together this manual series. So we talked about the retrofit manual. We talked about the IDPE manual. We this is pollution source control practices, municipal pollution prevention and good housekeeping, and then the unified sub-watershed and site reconnaissance manual. Um, so all of this information is out there. They have appendices, checklists, things to look for all for free, can be downloaded, and can be tweaked for your own municipality. So you're not starting from scratch. And I think that's, hopefully you guys can have that. So uh, in the Pollution Prevention and Good Housekeeping Manual? Manual 11. Manual 11. Oh, in Manual 11, there is a hot spot site investigation form, or an HSI. And it just walks you through <coughs> similar to what we're going to do in a second, walks you through a particular site and how you kind of assess it. Um, different things that you're looking for and how it's performing. Tom, 
Would you care to say anything about this slide? <laughs> King Kong London. There's a definite, um, in the NRC report, there was this, this demand or a, a, a need was identified to have more numeric assessment of pollution prevention practices at sites. So, in order to address that need of the numeric based approach, we put this together the stormwater benchmarking tool. And I'm happy to pass this around for you guys to look at. It has my notes in it, so I'll bring those back. Um, so the objectives of the tool, it only takes a couple hours to complete. You walk the entire site. Hopefully you walk it with your staff. Um, so it's a training opportunity as well. Um, identify very, you know, correctable stormwater problems, things that are easy, quick fixes. Um, increases staff awareness, like I just said. There is a component for watershed and community stewardship as a part of that, which you get points for if you do. If you decide that that's not a necessary benchmark. That's reasonable too. Um, you get outside, you get to walk around, you get to move around, which is always really nice. Get out away from your computer. Um, it can lead to action as opposed to just paperwork. And I think every time you do this, if you do it annually or if you do it quarterly, it's something you can document and take credit for. Um, and then it ultimately creates this quantitative scorecard um, based on overall site performance. So there are 22 benchmarks that are outlined in the document. Um, you're assessing both inside and outside of the facility um, and the stream that it might discharge to. It identifies specific tasks or activities that you would actually perform in order to gain points on the scorecard. And then, like I said, it's 100 points max, but you could adjust that if you found that your site was a little different. And the score we recommend that your site walks away with is a 95. So. The goal is to get as close to 100 as possible, just like you take any kind of test. Um, but, you know, again, keeping track, I think as Mike said earlier, like keeping track even if you have a lower score, but then all the follow-up actions that were taken to improve things, that demonstrates that um, progress is being made. So this, this is going to be probably the most interactive session we have. We're going to try to do a little exercise, a virtual exercise, and go through each of the benchmarks so that we all understand them. So the first benchmark is defining your watershed address. And the purpose of this is to kind of figure out where in the watershed your site is. So determine which stream you're draining to, which stream the facility is draining to, as well as where it is in the larger um, watershed area. So you can use Google Earth, like Tom mentioned earlier. Um, you can do web search, sometimes you can identify what your local watershed groups are and contact them about what the key water quality impairments are. The second benchmark, yeah, so you get a point, as you can see from your scoring sheets, you get a point for finding your, uh, find the closest stream to your facility, determining what the major watershed is, identify who with your watershed groups are. So there's like an education and outreach and stewardship component to this as well. Can you guys come help me with this? Sure. So our second benchmark, which I let, I'll let Tom do. We're going to tag team this one too. Um, is to drive a, a stormwater profile through your site. So in your mind's eye, think of your public works yards as you're going through. I guess that's how we're being interactive. And you kind of, you want to, analyze the layout to compute the runoff volume. And to give you some background, we first developed this for Coca-Cola International for the bottom facilities around the world. And uh, they didn't uh, realize how important stormwater was. Uh, so based on some simple things that you can get from your uh, site plan, which is site area, impervious cover, and runoff coefficient. Actually, just with these two, you can estimate runoff coefficient. You can compute the annual stormwater runoff produced at your site and the annual phosphorus, zinc, and oil and grease loads. Uh, and those are uh, the equations that are provided in the stormwater benchmarking tool. Uh, but this is, again, primarily educational. Uh, but for this facility, I say it's, uh, this would be very large for a public works there. But it says 24 acres. Well, this one is kind of a 
warehouse there at 92 percent in Houston is a about 10 inches more a year. But here's the uh, amount of uh, stuff in oil and grease, uh, essentially two barrels, 55 gallon barrels a year. So it just gets one of the big issues with the, the site manager and the compliance managers is to realize that they have some dirty runoff coming off their sites. So this just helps them do that. Uh, and some trace metals as well. Um, and what we did for Coca-Cola is we expressed how many uh, cases of product uh, of runoff, the uh, dirty runoff, was coming off the bottom facilities compared to how much output of Coke was coming from the facility. That, that really got the attention of the uh, uh, managers. So, want to go to the next one? Yeah. So, the third benchmark um, in the tool is to enhance employee training. So involve employees to increase their pollution prevention IQ. Um, so including them in the benchmark assessment, like I said, taking them out around the facility and having them go step by step through the tool. Customize the stormwater training based on your particular facility and your individual needs. And then include like a personal stewardship um, task at home as well. Yeah, and one of the things I would say when it comes to training, um, uh, many of the folks that organize that, that work at Public Works Yard, maybe instead of high school education and whatnot, so they really learn by doing. So taking them out on the benchmark assessment and having them help do the scoring, uh, that's something that will stay with them rather than this PowerPoint stuff that we've been killing you with all day. <laughs> Uh, the next step, I don't know how many points we get for it, is you should have a stormwater pollution prevention plan uh, for that facility. Um, if you don't, uh, when the EPA ever comes, it will let you know that. Uh, so you want to make check that your plan, um, where you want to improve the benchmark score. You can't get to 100 right away, you can't even get to 95 at most sites right away. But you find and review it, update it to reflect the findings from the benchmarking assessment, designate a lead individual. This is important to have somebody at the site who is not uh, the MS4 manager, but the one operating the site, and prominently post the score on the employee bulletin board. You start out with a 68 or a 55, it's like those, you know, will you eat a restaurant that had like a 42? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did last night. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Right, and I, I would just add on that the SWIP is mandatory as yeah. part if you have an industrial stormwater permit. But, but I think a lot of the SWIPs were cut and paste jobs by <laughs> consultants, and they, they don't really have a lot of customization for the. So what you started with is usually not that useful. So here's an example of that. Yeah. Understanding the plumbing at your site. Um, I think this kind of builds on what Tom was saying a minute ago about getting employees out on the site and understanding. We have visited a couple sites where you say, like, we started to have a stormwater, and they say, we don't know anything about stormwater. And then you say, well, where, when it rains, where does the water flow? Where are the inlets? You know, blah, blah. They know everything about the site and how the site operates and how the stormwater runs across the site. So they really do know stormwater. They just didn't know that they knew it. So um, trying to understand where the, I think there's another slide, where the water goes when it hits your site. Um, this involves, like it says, careful analysis of the site plan, but then also actually walking the site we know it doesn't always behave the way we think it will based on the site plan alone. So finding the storm drains, marking the storm drains, because that's a really big one, whether it's a marker or spray painting, that this water that's running off of your site is ending up in the stream. You use your local waterway. You know, you would, up here, you wouldn't mark it, oh, it goes to the Chesapeake Bay. You mark it that it goes to whatever river is local that people care about. Yeah, I've done this at, like, four sites where we caught people actually like cleaning paint into the storm drain while we were doing the benchmark stuff. Um, so it's make, 
the folks have no idea where the stormwater, I mean, they can figure out, as she said, where it goes, but they have no idea that it's going After to that. the stream. And, uh, that's an important one. And actually, can you do it back to one slide? I think another really important thing is it is part of your SWIP is having that site plan and having the storm drain, uh, the storm drain system clearly delineated or demarcated on a map so that other people know once it goes into an inlet or once it, you know, where the storm drains actually are running on the site. One of the things we commonly find is both industrial sites and public work yards are often 80 or 100 years old, right? Is that, you know? see a lot of new public works yards. I mean, how we see in this region to be in the floodplain, right? Uh, but one of the things that they evolve over time, uh, you know, Joe and Clem, you know, had a problem, so they put a ditch over here, and then there was a sewer over here in 1950, but then they add the new shed in 1962. And so because they evolve progressively, we're not always sure something that looks like it's a storm drain may actually be going to the sewer and so forth. So. Um, that kind of evolution thing, it's not always, uh, we were talking about institutional knowledge when uh, Mr. Hickman was here, uh, those people have already gone on to uh, the big storm water pond in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> right, and knowing, knowing what the storm drain is, you know, preventing that material from getting into the storm drain. Whose turn is it? Okay. Um, <laughs> retrofit rooftop runoff. We kind of talked about that a little bit today. I mean, we came up with a green roof idea. Um, rain barrels are really important. So this is just retrofit specific to industrial sites. We know most industrial or public works yards are highly built out. They're highly utilized. You're using every square inch of space. And so um, maybe retrofitting the impervious surface where you can. So maybe this is a foundation planter or a bioretention next to the facility. See if you could do cis turns or even disconnects if you have any pervious area on the site. This stuff might take a, um, using a design consultant to come up with a plan. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the big thing with this stuff is we want people to look at the downspouts, see if there's any potential for cheap treatment. And, you know, understand, it's again another way of understanding the plumbing at the site. This is the beginning of the plumbing. And we're not saying you have to retrofit the roof of your public works yard, uh, but if but if you can do it easily, easily and cheaply, like if you have some pervious area and you can disconnect, perfect. Um, one of the things about uh, public works yards is they're very high traffic. You're moving stuff across six or you know, six seasons, four seasons of the year, winter, summer. <laughs> well, you got piles over here. You're moving it. You then you got all the stuff from the fireworks stuff. You're moving it around. Uh, so you want to look where the uh, traffic is, um, and so you're looking, and this is more of an industrial example of loading and unloading areas um, where you're going from the lot to the roof. This is trucking stuff, uh, but one of the things we look for is these are the areas of spill and where people do a lot of, we want to make sure people are sweeping rather than doing wash downs, covering uh, loading docks, and, and redesigning the drainage so that uh, folks aren't uh, sending pollutants into the storm. Now we have some pictures coming up that will show that in a minute. Um, preventing parking lot pollution is one of the benchmarks. So what we're looking for is to evaluate the condition, the drainage, and the maintenance of the parking lot area um, to reduce runoff and you know, mitigate or reduce pollutants. So we want to stabilize unpaved lots, which you'll see a lot of right in municipal work there. You have a lot of dirt lots. Um, we want to walk the lot, lots monthly to find and fix any leaks. I mean, this is a, a really good picture. That's a pretty nasty parking lot. Weekly trash and litter pickup, monthly sweeping of the lot, which, as Tom mentioned earlier, would, could ultimately become, will ultimately become another credit, credible urban BMP that can be used. Um, and then just use special care with power washing and seal coating to reduce those pollutants. Those are some pretty nasty pictures up there. Yeah, and just one one comment. Probably with public works yards are unique that they uh, not just paved. They have a lot of bare earth. So one of the choices, and I'm not saying pave over your public works yards, but if there's areas where in some areas that are producing a lot of sediment, it may be wise to 
pay them and direct the runoff to the new stormwater treatment area uh, because um, that can be a, a major problem. All right, um, <clears throat> most public works yards have fueling areas. Uh, those are a prime candidate. We have two slides here. I'll uh, show you which one is a better uh, situation. I'm going to go with the bottom one. And what might be the reason for that? Well, I think it's covered. Yeah, that's so one. that's Point probably that. good. <laughs> What's this answer? right here? Uh, is that a spill kit? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so you're looking for, you want your fueling islands to be covered, to protect it from the runoff in case there is a spill. You want to have the spill response kits on site. Having that, I mean, I can tell you that when they do those EPA inspections, when they, they have the spill response kits, it's like the box where they check, just like the covered fuel. Um, redesign flow, if um, there is flow mingling over there that would ultimately enter the storm drain, either protecting the storm drain or redesigning it so that flow goes elsewhere. Uh, seasonal operations and outdoor wash water, I think we touched on this earlier, outdoor material storage is another one. Um, so we're looking for seasonal operations at the site that would result in high pollutants. So that might be um, fertilizer applications, that picture or salt storage, which we talked a little bit before about. Um, some of the other stuff we're looking for, Tom, do you want to talk about off-site truck washing? Yeah, that's probably one of the more common issues at public works yards. They have dirty trucks. That's someone was actually you were asking me about that as well, where you know, you're running a lot of trucks through, back trucks and so forth. You should be cleaning them indoors and making sure the wash water doesn't go off. But uh, there's some cases where, you know, because you're dealing with a lot of dirty stuff, if you're washing it outside, just make sure there's a containment area so you can get the sediment and hopefully divert it to an area that's uh, you know, not directly to the stream. Uh, you have a, this is the, the point that Hickman was making earlier about the salt storage. Uh, uh, it's also kind of, salt's pretty expensive, and if you're just letting it go into the stream, that's not much. Uh, public works yards, they do a lot of vehicle repairs and fluids, and most communities have a lot of real old equipment. And they have not only real old equipment, but equipment that doesn't work anymore. Remember scary. Chestertown? That was like, that's oh. <laughs> what is it, Samara? Uh, so investigate, you want to do it inside, make sure that the fluids and fluids don't use the storm drain system. So again, no outdoor repairs, check indoor shop drains. This is a pretty common thing where sometimes the indoor shop drains are connected to the storm drain system outside. And so you think you're doing a great job, but you're just still migrating in the storm drain system. So that's an important thing for the plumbing. You want to investigate it inside the uh, building to make sure you have the proper fluid and disposal recycling practices. So here's an example about that um, that I included. So we've got the shop drain inside where a lot of the vehicle repairs are happening, but um, I think you were mentioning earlier um, where there are the bay, the truck bay, so, you know, you've got, here's a storm drain inlet, so anything that's being you know, is coming down and going right in there. It's really messy. Um, evaluating spill control response, uh, you want to walk the site to find the areas of greatest spill risk and critically evaluate how to uh, do plant spill capability and where you have high risk areas. We've shown you on the fueling area already. You want to put spill kits. Uh, two other uh, things that I've used at facilities is make sure that everybody in there who works in, the, in their wallet or the first has the emergency contact numbers uh, if there's a spill uh, handy because you don't want them to have to go to the office and say, somewhere in the pollution prevention plan, where the hell is the pollution prevention plan? Who do I call them? Or um, have them posted on the wall too. And the, right. the other thing, too, is to create an unannounced fake spill. Get some green dye, call it in, and see how your employees... <laughs> you know, having a plan doesn't always mean the plan can be executed. And that, I think, is a great teaching moment. Um, and again, it's one of those uh, 
you don't want to do it like a gotcha you know, thing, but it, it does kind of show how robust you are with. So preventing um, runoff with outdoor storage, I think we touched on this a little bit, but again, we're walking the site to look for um, materials that are stored outside on either a temporary or permanent basis. I think Mike said this, whether it was salt storage or mulch piles, um, anything that can come into contact with rainfall, then you want to figure out where the runoff goes from there, right? Because anything that's coming into contact with the rainfall or the runoff is then ultimately getting into the storm drain slash drain system. So placing materials on pallets, like these these drums are on pallets? That's an example of a good example. Well, they're on pallets. Um, temporary cover, if, ne if possible. Secondary containment and burn, so that if they do leak or burst or whatever, that they are contained and they don't end up in the storm drain system. And then, of course, like we saw in that parking lot, any streaks or stain lines um, indicate, you know, that the runoff is ending up, that the polluted runoff is ending up in the storm drain system. Very, <laughs> I think it's very like common sense kind of stuff. So this was an example of an unnamed public works yard where they did outdoor material storage and it's covered, so that's good. But what do you else do, you guys? Storm inlet. Storm inlet. Why is it white? So. So. It's being kind of like tracked across the yard, and then it ends up in the storm drain system anyway. Or it's just shaking out the trucks too after they load it up. So mm -hmm. that I think it's some type of set apart swale or something like that, and feed it somewhere else. Some kind of burn or something. Yeah. Once we went to that site and went through this Ben Perky tool with them, they were like, we heard back from the town administrator, they were all over it, cleaning it up. Supposedly it was great. They just didn't know. Uh, dumpster management, you usually, uh, every site seems to have a dumpster. Uh, we look, some have compactors. Uh, so you're looking for dumpster juice. And dumpster juice just comes from dumpsters that are exposed to rainwater and have leaks. And they can be very uh, uh, problem in terms of their stuff. They want to have the dumpsters covered, have lids, and be watertight. Uh, you want to schedule the uh, pickup so you don't get the overloading conditions. Uh, and disconnect uh, the dumpsters from the storm drain system. Here's the leaking dumpster. Uh, this is what he was talking about, the streak line and the storm drain. And that is something that, uh, unlike a lot of other practices, you have a lot of flexibility about where the dumpsters are located. So in this case, just moving the dumpster 20 feet would uh, reduce its impact. Uh, here are some other examples of at this unknown Atlanta, Georgia location. <laughs> you have the street line. They're storing metal that has a leak and it's going to the storm drain. Here's a uh, a compactor with juice and other stuff going to a storm drain. And so when people see this, they, they just need to realize it's not good. That there are pollutants associated with that. Turf management and conversion. So earlier, Tom touched a little bit on urban nutrient management. Um, this benchmark is looking for the open and landscaped areas and can you use any of them to treat stormwater like we just talked about in the retrofit exercise or could you convert some of those turf areas um, to trees or could you employ urban nutrient management on those existing turf areas so you're evaluating all the turf areas at a particular site for opportunities for reduced mowing soil restoration reforestation um, retrofit you get one, and according to the tool, you get one point for every 3% of converted turf. So here's a good example um, on, the, on this side where they took a downspout and directed it to a bioretention rain garden area. So that's kind of a retrofit of the existing turf area. Now, you can get points for looking at your uh, existing procurement contracts uh, to make sure your contractors are doing urban nutrient management uh, rather than uh, 
broadly applied in long term maintenance. And probably the biggest source, it's not a nutrient or sediment, but it's probably the biggest toxic thing a lot of people don't understand. Um, pesticides are found um, in urban streams uh, at a higher rate than agricultural streams, and one of the biggest sources are the uh, herbicides that are applied to keep fence lines uh, clear of grass. Uh, they're some of the uh, most toxic herbicides out there. Um, so I just mentioned that in past. Every uh, place has a parking lot. Uh, you have to have employees. It means you have a lot. We already talked about uh, retrofits, so I'll skip over this one given the time we have left. You've seen that picture too. <laughs> and this one kind of builds on the last urban nutrient management one we were just talking about using green landscaping practices. Um, so, modifying contracts to reduce your fertilizer and pesticide use. Um, yeah, okay, I, we already talked so about that. So, this is that point, you know, nature did not create that boundary. Herbicides did, and you know, not to say it does reduce your cost, but if this is within, as it turns out, five feet of a stream, it's not a wise idea. So we've talked about that. That's the expert panel report. We've talked about illicit discharge. That's one of the benchmarks. So going around the facility and looking at the storm drain system and looking for illicit discharges. So you're going to be doing that anyway. For credit, so why not look for that and also check it off on your benchmarking tool? That's the expert panel report. Um, you get points for maintaining your stormwater infrastructure. Uh, you want to, to go out there, since you need to lead by example, and make your inspections up, you know, twice a year, clean out your storm drain inlets once a year. I mean, you, you're the ones with the back trucks after all. Uh, and will provide the recommended maintenance of any practices located on the property. So the 20th benchmark is natural area conservation. We're looking to assess any the condition and habitat of <coughs> any adjacent uh, forests, wetlands, buffers, or conservation areas that are either at the site or nearby the site. Um, just knowing that those resource areas are out there I think is really important. Kind of talked about that with the retrofit session um, so knowing that that's an inventory or knowing adding them to your inventory and knowing that that's a resource for you guys um, this one is more for the industrial facilities so they don't not often connecting what their um, operations have to do with the customers they have in the, in the watershed but the public are your customers as well so uh, becoming a uh, watershed par partner, uh, maybe having some of the, uh, your employees uh, join or do volunteer work uh, with those. Yeah, like one of the industrial facilities in Baltimore, they had their employee participate, partner with a wa local watershed group to do a trash pickup, a kayaking trip, where they pick up all the trash out of the Inner Harbor, because trash is a major problem in the Baltimore Inner Harbor. I think it was you know, once a year they have their employees doing it. It's kind of fun. We did that here too. Yeah. Uh, and the last one, and this is more education for um, uh, your own employees, is to make that connection. You, know, you can mark a storm drain, but to actually, for them to under, go the next thousand feet down the stream and realize that it, it really is going downstream, uh, if you can safely do it, um, to try to, uh, you can see this is what we ended up doing with the code. So to take your employees on a stream walk for the nearest accessible segment point, and then work with that watershed group to adopt the stream cleanup for that segment. Um, so when this is used, most facilities end up initially in this range you know, somewhere between four to fair, uh, but that's not unusual. Uh, the bar is pretty high. A lot of the activities are, you know, I think, certainly useful to do, but not always current progress. If you score really low, we suggest that you uh, shred the evidence 
uh, well, I don't know, EPA will come back. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you have multiple sites across the townships, this helps you just figure out which ones to uh, work on. And, uh, and, you know, it does, even if you score somewhere in here, it doesn't take too much to get to bring your score up. And I think when it comes to um, human nature, uh, you can, certainly with teenagers, you can tell them, do this, make your bed, da 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 but if there's a quantitative way of assessing their performance, uh, most people want to do well, and uh, it gives them something to shoot for, uh, rather than just saying, you know, shame on you, it gives them a chance to work up the ladder and get better. Plus, I would say it would be good for that project file, uh, if you ever got this. <laughs> so now it's your turn. We've got a couple slides and then we'll be done. But so we're going to quiz you guys. What do you see about this site? What would you do here? What are some of the problems? Anything? We've got material leaching out onto the property coming down to a drain right there. That's right. So what could you do here? prevent that material getting into this well, I guess one, the idea I would have is this is a paved yard, so if I have a sweeper, I'd want to sweep it, you know, schedule sweeping first time in the spring, make sure to pick up that salt. Try to keep the material back in underneath so it doesn't get hit by any rain. Mm-hmm, push it back up in there. Let's give them a hard one. Go burns. Move the drain. Yeah, Repave, regrade. <laughs> Uh, what's wrong here? Uh, it's like a packer. This is a dumpster. Mm -hmm. Where's the, the drains packer. right there? It looks like it's a, a drain. Drain. Oh, yeah, I know. That's a packer. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Uh, this so hurt. this was good. They put it on. I mean, they put everything on pallets. So that was a good thing. There's a drain right under it. What would you do? <laughs> what else could be done? Secondary um, container. Secondary container. Or an observant pad underneath that would work too. They actually they look like one stuff. battery is laying over. Those are batteries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, really? Gasoline mixed with the. Yeah, yeah, that's always good. Gasoline, batteries. <laughs> this <laughs> is. They could throw some wrenches across. Either, <laughs> just, <laughs> either dispose of the batteries <laughs> or move them inside. But I love that it's on a pallet. Yeah, <laughs> a, I bet they'd check those batteries first with their tongue. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So you could cover it, maybe you could dispose of those things, maybe move them inside if you need to keep them. What is this? Uh, I don't really know. It's actually mm -hmm. one of the nice resources in these areas. We actually do have one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, American supplier of absorbent cleanup products yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And they're New really pig. generous about that uh, safety clean? Safety clean. Yeah. New pig. And they're really generous about giving us stuff when we ask. So, they like uh, promoting their products and giving us a, a fairly decent, I think it extends to most municipalities, but we, they're actually very uh, corporately friendly. They're located in Blair County. Uh, yeah, just about the 10 miles from here. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> So this, I mean, we This is a public works yard? Yeah, the public works yard. We've seen pictures like this already. What do you guys see here? Is that mud? Yeah. Yep. But it's a paved lot. lot. If you pack enough mud across that hill, it'll block it up. <laughs> it's all right, blocked up pretty good. Salt's, yeah. salt's not covered. Salt's okay. not covered. Yeah, the eyes, and an exposed dumpster, sort of, this is where... EPA goes crazy with this one. <laughs> well, public works yards are always changing, and it just means uh, it, you can't just do this inspection once a year. you got to do it through the seasons as you change over because your problems and issues will change over time. And, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're just letting the latex paint evaporate. Yeah. That's what they tell us to do. This is Using them as rain barrels? It's a <laughs> <laughs> very artistic public works yard. But yeah, yeah this is an issue that small. we see constantly. Uh, where you have to paint things, uh, figuring out a uh, uh, Proper way to dispose of and clean up the materials. Evaporate your paint and yeah, cover it. Actually, stops someone from pouring paint in an inlet in town, 
and they told me no, it's okay because it's water soluble. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. I'm <laughs> thinking the problem through, you know. That's, yeah, yeah. That's reacting. That's a really good excuse, and I have to remember that one. Mm. And this is exactly what we just talked about. Somebody dumped in the. That is a port-a-potty. Port Gross. <laughs> 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 no, actually, this is not. A, it's an export-a-potty. Yeah. It's no longer in use. It's exported. Oh, <laughs> 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 it's terrible. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. Did we want to? No, I think that one uh, suits yourself. <laughs> Spill kit. There's not an overhang. It's not that right. right. So, one check for the spill kit, but then. A Demarcation for the not being Yeah, those are just those are yeah. dump stuff in. Like, that's you, actually a key for gravel and stuff. They got all sorts of gravel in there. You use like that, and you're like, like that's why they do inspections. See, mulch, mm -hmm. uh, you see all sorts of cut stuff. Uh, yeah, clean fill, asphalt, whatever that stuff is on the left. Millings. Millings, yeah. And to some extent, because of the dynamic nature, you know, you've got stuff, we're bringing it in for day two. In some cases, you just want to make sure they're getting in and getting out at a higher frequency so this might occur, but you don't want it there for days or weeks for it to be hit by stuff. Or if you have to have a site, I mean, I can't imagine having a site like that. There are ways to protect your storm drains. Yeah. 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 I think this was actually an abandoned set of uh, external tanks. So they don't have to worry about any grass growing through there. So. <laughs> 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 this is the reverse of secondary <laughs> containment. This is non-secondary containment. Uh, so it goes directly into the mm -hmm. storm. So that's kind of... The golf course. I would yeah. say golf. That's what I would do. Mm -hmm. There's anything wrong there. Converted to a training public. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice horse park. Integrated pest management. Oh, great. Localities yeah. sometimes operate their own golf courses. I don't know whether that's common here. You know, it's in the counties of Maryland, so they have an opportunity to, to do that. This is a, is a hospital. So it's not owned by a municipality, but let's say we're municipally owned. Mm -hmm. need a little parking mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that come in late. It's like a, a World Heritage site for that. <laughs> so we've seen several like that already. Dumpster Jews over there. Pavement. We've talked about covered fueling areas. Well, one last point on this is we, I've seen this quite a bit where you have covered fueling islands, which protect us from getting wet when we fill up our tank, but the grade of it is such that the rain mm -hmm. on the other side goes through and okay. runs over, into this case, to a storm drain. So it's working to keep us from getting wet, it's not working to keep um, food inside the storm drain. But that's not a sheep. So that's one of the things I learned yesterday, <laughs> is that you guys are the home of Mr. Sheets. The Sheets family. The Sheets family. Yeah. So, uh, I always remember the saying. And mothers and turkey. So what would you do here? Mm -hmm. Brothers and turkey. Yeah. With this dumpster. Yeah, <laughs> cover it, right? It's pretty basic. And the idea is there are a lot of dumpster contractors, so sometimes you have to work with them to say, no, this dumpster needs a liner, this dumpster you need to get it more frequently. They are working for you, so you want to make sure you're working for them. Is that this one? Yeah, it's dirty. <laughs> That says sanitary. Nope. It doesn't happen around here. Sanitary. The water authority would never let that happen out there. <laughs> sanitary overflowing into the street. That would never happen. They, they, they have a, he has a policy against it. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what they need, a policy. Yeah. It's a bell telephone, man. There you go. Mm -hmm.
So again, just some resources out there for you guys to get you going if you don't already have them or if you don't already have what you need for your own sites. The pollution, the stormwater benchmarking tool, which I sent around and we just talked through. The retrofit manual, pollution source control manual, municipal pollution prevention of good housekeeping, the USA manual, the USSR manual. <laughs> And Some of us are old enough to all remember those that. Reports. So again, they're all there for you. You can always email either of us and ask if you can't find something on our website. But I'll try to get everything to Donna's. You know, we could at least put a link up to everything that. Yeah. You guys mentioned. And then with that, I think we're done. And I'll just um, I'll say that. Are you going to say something about the? Yes, I am. Well, well, thank you very much. It's been a yeah, pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom and Cecilia. Yeah.